Good morning to the West Coast of the United States and good afternoon or evening to those of you around the United States or around the world. I'm Jonathan Visbal, the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of World Affairs, and I wanted to add my welcome to all of you. Thank you for attending the Global Philanthropy Forum for the second year in a row, virtually. And I know it's tough as we move from a COVID pandemic to endemic, we hope to have the chance to convene again in person. It sure will be nice to do so. And I also wanted to thank you for being action-oriented philanthropists. I'm encouraged by your ability to tackle the world's biggest problems through public-private partnerships and through being a beacon for multilateralism. Today, we're gonna to focus on taking a deep dive into the prospects for COVID endemic world and ways private equity, health, and uh, well-being for all. We'll start by looking at sustainable development goals as a blueprint, focusing on progress at the local level and how that local level can spark a global change. Today, we have Tony Pippa, Senior Fellow, Center for Sustainable Development at the Brookings Institution, and Shaheen Kasim Laka, Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. They will take today's meeting and lead it off. And Shaheen, I'll turn it over to you and uh, enjoy today's session. Uh, I thank you for all in for being in attendance today. Thanks and goodbye. Thanks, thank Kathy. you so much, Jonathan. And let me add my welcome to our audience today from whichever time zone you're joining us from. And um, I'm delighted to be in conversation with Tony Pippa, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution Center for Sustainable Development. And we're gonna be discussing the role of cities and by extension, their citizens in promoting equity, health, and well being for all. While in the Obama administration, Tony was special envoy at the State Department, leading the US delegation at the UN to negotiate and adopt the Sustainable Development Goals. At the Brookings Institution, he launched and manages the local leadership on the SDGs initiative. This leads him to work with mayors and local leaders from the US and around the world as they adapt and use the SDGs as a policy framework to progress, to mobilize progress on their social, economic, and environmental priorities. We will be using this framework for discussion today as Tony and I, through a partnership between the Hilton Foundation and Brookings Institution, have been on a journey together to, to explore how local populations in both the global north and the global south can leverage the SDGs to improve their quality of life. As a reminder, the SDGs or Global Goals were adopted in 2015 by 193 countries, including the United States. And they were done to drive efforts to end poverty, protect the planet and reduce inequities and to do so in a way that leaves no one behind. However, they're often perceived as being lofty and aspirational and not necessarily practical or relevant to subnational jurisdictions or the general population. Much of our conversation will revolve around how the goals have been adapted and adopted by local communities and cities in a sense to hold their nations accountable, but also to demonstrate the contribution of local actors. So Tony, we're now approaching, not quite, but the midpoint of the era of the Sustainable Development Goals. Keeping in mind the current trends and pressures towards nationalism and political and ideological divides, and we heard about some of this from Mark um, Malik Brown yesterday. From your vantage point, does this framework remain relevant in the area of pandemic crises and the social justice movement? And in particular, as we in philanthropy move to recognize the role of local actors and proximate leadership, do the SDGs have a role? Well, thank you, Shaheen. That's a, a big question and, and good to, to get us started. But first, before I jump into that, just want to thank you uh, um, and really looking forward to this conversation with you and, and for the partnership that we've had together. And also um, just really pleased to be here and thank uh, the Global Philanthropy Forum for, uh, for having this conversation around the Sustainable Development Goals. So in terms of relevance, uh, I think even before we jump into COVID and you know the, the, the social justice movements that are looking to address systemic issues of racism and marginalization, both in the US and across the world, I think it's even good to think about the relevance of the SDGs prior to that. Um, what do they provide us as a, as a framework? And, uh, and one of those is a North Star, right? The SDGs, because they are goals, 
because they are time bound, meant to be achieved by 2030, uh, and meant to be measured in terms of progress with data and evidence as a way to say, how well are we doing? They really require, they're a North Star. They require a sort of a discipline of development for us to be thinking about how to achieve progress on the dimensions that you talked about, right? And so while they're ambitious and they're lofty, they're also uh, requiring of us to really stay focused and to understand where we're getting return on investments, both of resources and the allocations of those resources. And they really ask us to address issues of inequality, both between countries and within countries. They ask us to leave no one behind and to prioritize the most vulnerable uh, uh, communities first. Secondly, they require a mindset shift right? I mean, the SDGs are pretty broad. Uh, they sort of cover every aspect of development, as you just talked about. But what that asks of us is that we're trying to solve multiple problems at once. And we can't make uh, progress on taking action on climate change and a climate agenda at the same time. Uh, and, we, and we have to do that at the same time as we create a more inclusive and fair and equitable economy. Those two things need to go together and need to be linked um, rather than be thought of in isolation. Uh, COVID, as you asked about, was a, at its heart a public health crisis, right? But look at the interdependence and look at the implications of that public health crisis on our economy. Um, look at the inequities that it surfaced uh, both in terms of its impact on the black and brown communities in the United States, and also the inconsistencies and inequities around how we're treating it globally from country to country, uh, and the, the access that countries have to vaccinations and to resources uh, to be able to respond uh, to the crisis. Um, and so I think the, the relevance uh, in COVID-19 uh, and the implications of a pandemic like that really show the importance of the SDGs because the SDGs sort of highlight that interdependence and ask us to take on multiple issues at once. And the SDGs also break down the dichotomy uh, and the distinction between developed and developing countries, right? No longer is development, you know, it, just for one set of countries or one set of places. You know, it asks us to look at development as a continuum and understands that, you know, we all have work to do, right? In any right. of our communities, in any of our countries. So um, let me pick up on that, sorry. Sure. But, you know, maybe you can speak to how they've been a platform for global cooperation. Are they inspiring any, you know, creativity, new ways of, partnering, um, just to, to build on what you were saying. So you mentioned, you know, um, nationalism and the pressures that we're feeling for sort of lots of different countries, including the US, turn, US turning more inward uh, since the SDGs were created and, and launched and, you know, agreed to in 2015 and launched in 2016. And, and I mean, and Mark Malik Brown was even talking about this yesterday, the pressures that that's put on the official multilateral system, right? It's really been difficult to, to foster global cooperation in an era. Uh, and the SDGs really depended on that. I mean, they were a high point of like solidarity amongst countries uh, to be able to move forward on this global agenda as ambitious as it was. Uh, so I think we've seen, uh, uh, you know, it's been difficult within the official multilateral system um, from the point of from the point of view of nation states who agreed to and signed up to this agenda. But what's been really interesting is to see the kind of cooperation happening uh, at the local level of governance. So I think a, a, an untold story is the kind of global cooperation that's happening for example, from cities to cities uh, across the world. That's happening on climate through things like C40, uh, through through things like ICLE, which is a, a network of more mid-sized cities. C40 is a, 
a, a network of large cities uh, from across the world that are taking collective action on climate, which is really important uh, given that so many, uh, since the majority of the emissions uh, across the world, for example, uh, emanate in cities. And so them being able to take action and they're cooperating, they're sharing best practices, they're making uh, uh, global commitments together. Um, and we see that also in the kinds of things that are happening through, you know, community of practice that we have, the SDG leadership cities, where we have cities from the US, we have cities from other places in the global north, we have cities from the global south, working together and collaborating on an agenda about how they can innovatively take this agenda that has their benchmarks and has the perspective of a national government, but adapt it to their local realities um, for their local citizens to take on their local priorities. And in the process, actually being a linchpin for global progress and global cooperation. I mean, you even saw the kind of cooperation that happened at the city level where these are on the front, they were on the front lines of COVID-19 pandemic. Right. Um, and US cities were learning a great deal from cities, for example, in Italy and other places and and uh, and and the Far East where the um, where the pandemic started. Uh, and then we're also um, providing that same kind of uh, best practices and, and innovations and what worked for them for, for other cities that were that knew that the pandemic would actually come to them uh, a little later as well. No, great examples of global collaboration. Um, we were originally going to be joined by Mayor Yvonne Akisoy of Freetown Sierra Leone uh, through a video presentation to hear firsthand from the experience of a local leader. Uh, but unfortunately, this won't be possible due to unforeseen circumstances. So, Tony, please put on your mayor's hat and channel uh, Mayor Yvonne and many of the other mayors you work with um, as we reflect on that very local dimension. And perhaps you can tell us a bit more about what, what about the SDGs resonates, not just for local leaders, but how do they, how do they relate for, for citizens? Um, do they feel like a really distant agenda or something that they can do for their own health and well-being? And are, are there any particular goals that resonate for citizens? As opposed sure, to so, so I would answer that in a couple of different ways. One is sort of the opportunity the SDGs provide to create a model of governance that's inclusive. Uh, and that goes beyond just government to both stakeholders and citizens uh, at the local level. And Freetown and Mayor Vaughn are a great example of that, for example. Uh, when she took office, she embarked on uh, a visioning process across the city that um, was very grassroots. They had 15,000 people participate in called Transform uh, Freetown, right? And then as they were doing that, they were realizing that the local priorities that they landed on and what really meant a lot to the citizens of the city aligned with this global framework, the SDGs. And it provided them a coherent way to put it all together and also to hold themselves accountable as a city for what progress would look like because of the data and uh, the data-driven and basis and the focus on evidence that the SDGs ask. Uh, um, and we see that actually happening uh, across the world. Um, the SDGs being a common language if you speak that, that different cities and different local leaders are speaking to allow them to speak to each other, uh, to be able to share what they're doing and also collectively move together. Again, I'll just stick with Mary Vaughn, which is a great example of this. Um, you know, very involved in uh, a gender equity network of cities that Los Angeles has started, which is actually part of Los Angeles's focus on the SDGs. Um, something that Mayor Garcetti in Los Angeles, you know, started even with executive directives within the city about how they ought to be focusing on gender, uh, and then created a platform for cities to come together that Freetown is actually participating in. Uh, Mayor Yvonne is also chairing a, a network of cities from Africa that are working with a network of cities in Europe around growth and inclusive growth and solidarity, especially as it relates to migrants coming into cities. 
uh, and how to be inclusive uh, it, with, with newcomers to their particular cities. So you see this global cooperation. It, it provides a common language, a common platform, if you will. But at the same time, it provides an, an opportunity to be coherent with your policy decision making uh, and with creating partnerships with other stakeholders, with local philanthropy, with, uh, with your citizens, with universities, civil society, and local business as well. Thanks for mentioning LA. Um, as you know, the Hilton Foundation has also been collaborating with the city of LA and the mayor's office around the SDGs. And just to, to mention that LA found that the framework provided a great way to engage students um, and mm. academic institutions in the policy dialogues that you mentioned um, with various city departments, but as well as with data collection on issues that are as wide ranging as urban heat islands, housing security, uh, veteran services, and even biodiversity um, protection and management. So I, I think that there's a, a good examples of how um, to use the framework. Yeah, and I would, I, I mean, and, and I'll pick up even on other cities. I mean, it, it's really, you asked about, are there particular goals that resonate? I think those resonate for different cities in different contexts. Right. For example, in Mexico City, they've used the SDGs focusing on urban violence, but it's given them a multi-dimensional sort of cross-disciplinary way to think about urban violence. It's not just about security, but it's about making investments in particular neighborhoods um, with greater educational opportunity, greater job opportunities. In Bogota, they're using it to focus on sort of the caregiving uh, industry and the centrality of women in that and, and much of it in an informal economy. And so focusing their policy attention to bring them more inclusively into the economy and to build up their equity and, and empower uh, folks working in that particular industry. Um, and so, uh, and in Accra, uh, the mayor there used them to, to look at sanitation and also that intersection with the informal economy and how to be more inclusive and bring more uh, in people who are working more informally in that economy into the into the systems and the official ways in which uh, Accra was trying to improve uh, its sanitation and its water and, and sewer as well. So uh, I, I think there are different priorities that different local leaders are taking on that make sense to them, but the SDGs provide, again, this common language as well as this multi-dimensional way to be thinking about it. And to your point around the data, uh, it, it provides a, a level of transparency and accountability using the data and evidence about what their progress is like on that. Oh, that's fantastic. But, uh, let me pick up on that data point. I mean, a big part of the SDGs is that nations have to report back against them, both right. annually as well as, as we, you know, um, to show progress as we as we make um, as we approach twenty thirty. What what are local um, communities, local cities, how do they get to be part of that reporting process? Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so in the official architecture of the UN, um, we really, when we, when we were inside the General Assembly and negotiated this, we didn't officially set aside a space for local governments um, or citizens to sort of report on their progress or on their contributions to this global agenda. What happens officially at the UN, as you said, is that countries, you know, submit on a voluntary basis uh, what's called a voluntary national review to elaborate their progress and, and also how they're participating in solidarity with other countries to make progress on this collective agenda. But New York, uh, when they did their one NYC city plan, city strategy, uh, that was that happened around the same time as the SDGs were launched, they realized that there was a lot of alignment there. And so they aligned that city strategy to the SDGs. And being a city where the UN is hosted, they understood that countries were making these uh, reports. So they decided to pioneer their own local report, what they call a voluntary local review, um, to say, here's what progress we as a city are making on the SDGs. And here are our plans to accelerate that progress. 
And that's being picked up and has become a global movement. And they've actually, you know, created a declaration that they tried to set cities up to. But we've had several cities in the United States now do this. We've had Los Angeles, Pittsburgh, Orlando, state of Hawaii has done a, a voluntary local review. Um, but it also has really uh, rippled out across the world. You, you have more than a hundred voluntary local reviews already completed with a couple hundred more in the pipeline that we know of commitments. Um, and so to, to mayors like Mayor Yvonne, who's committed to also doing a voluntary local review, this provides them an opportunity to coherently all in one place say, here's the kind of progress that we're making, here are the opportunities for us, here are the gaps that we're experiencing, and if we stay on business as usual, here's how close or how far away we'll get to. Uh, and uh, provides them, I think, an opportunity to talk to philanthropy, uh, to talk to other partners, to talk to business about the contributions, and to make this a whole of society effort rather than just an effort that is uh, about government alone. And that was really a point um, I'm glad you made because it's not just the public sector right. uh, whose contributions need to count. And maybe at some point you can speak a little bit about how does philanthropy's contributions count within whether it's the VLRs or the national reports or whatever. And I just did want to put a plug in for LA um, because they're reporting on 159 SDG indicators on an open source platform. So that's one example of how that can be done. And incidentally, that's more than the US government at the moment. But um, are there other such creative ways for you know, philanthropic and citizen contributions to map? Well, well, pointing to LA's dashboard is a real opportunity right there. You had, for example, Central Florida Foundation uh, invest in doing a community level dashboard where they took the social determinants of health and the SDGs as the basis for saying, Here's how well we're doing as a region that we cover um, at the community level. It, the SDGs ask us to look at what the community level outcomes are being uh, are looking like and how philanthropy and other efforts, policy interventions or civil society or business are contributing to uh, what progress might look like in that particular uh, place. I also think, um, you know, at a local level, and and we had uh, uh, Helene Gale participate in uh, an event that we just did uh, recently, who, who heads up the Chicago Community Trust, talking about um, the importance of taking seriously what looks like a global framework, but how important it is locally uh, because of what we're asked, what we're asking others to do uh, globally, and so making that link between the local and the global, and uh, and the importance of disaggregating the data, potentially geospatially, are there particular neighborhoods uh, that ought to be targeted? Demographically, what does it look like? Be it race, age, um, different kinds of demographics. Um, and also using it as a way to, again, bring different levels of stakeholders together uh, that share a, a common vision on what progress might need to look like and talk about what the next steps are over you know, the short term and long term to be able to get there. Um, the one thing I would say about philanthropy, interestingly, at, a, at an aggregate level around the SDGs, and we've seen foundations such as the Hilton Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation and say the Gates Foundation see themselves reflected in the SDGs in some way and, and use the framework as a way to describe and measure what their investments are looking like and what progress would look like. But as a collective, it's interesting to me. I mean, we've seen, for example, uh, a, a, a Business and Sustainable Development Commission that Mark Malik Brown chaired actually uh, that looked at businesses and what the role of businesses would look like uh, at the global level for creating progress on these goals. The Secretary General has a Global Investors for Sustainable Development, uh, where leading CEOs are coming together uh, from the investment community to talk about how their investments as a collective can help uh, create global momentum and uh, how they can work together collectively to be a part of that. We actually haven't seen that from philanthropy. We haven't seen a global collective effort of 
you know, uh, leading foundations and, and philanthropists come together to say, collectively, what should be the role of philanthropy in sort of pushing this agenda forward? So I think there's a real opportunity there. Uh, where the film profit world. I would agree. I would agree. I would just say that the OECD is trying to collect that information and they're tracking um, the contributions of philanthropy. So I don't want to lose sight of that. But I don't see it as a global movement in the way you're describing. I do want to share one of the questions in the chat, which is how can the experience of the USA in Africa help us in the Asia Pacific? Well, I think we've talked about, for example, the voluntary local reviews um, as a tool, and that's an innovation, and that's a way in which local level uh, leaders anywhere across in the world that can actually use and adapt. And it's not, there's not one kind of playbook for it. I mean, local leaders can do what they want. I just, uh, a couple of days ago, received a draft from uh, Yokohama, which has done its first voluntary local review. Um, and, and is about to launch in, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, so I think that there is a lot of opportunity there. And I think there's opportunity um, for cities and local leaders in that region of the world to be participating in the kind of city to city cooperation and networks that we've talked about, uh, to be able to be connected up. Uh, and there are all levels and sizes, actually, of these kinds of cities. And it I think the interesting thing that uh, has been very innovative is that cities sort of take the agenda where they're at, right? They don't try yeah. to, um, they they use it based on the capacity that they have. The They'll, they'll narrow it down to the priorities that they think are important for them locally. Um, and they'll engage with their local citizenry in a way that makes sense given their history and, and the legacy of how they, uh, what those interactions look like. We're almost at time, but I think there's a really important question that's being asked in the chat as well. And that is the benefits of the SDGs for rural communities. And I think you'll have a particular connection to that, Tony. So um, if you can say, respond in a minute or so, so we can have time for closing. So I really think that uh, the intersection of the environmental, the economic and the human social is extremely relevant for rural communities. Um, they tend to be, many rural communities are extractive economies um, where natural assets are being used, um, but uh, but the, the wealth that's created off those natural assets happens somewhere else. Um, and protecting those natural assets are for future generations is going to be a key point. So how to balance that with a new type of inclusive in economy um, and addressing the issues of education and connectivity and um, poverty and, and hunger are, 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 extremely, are extremely relevant and provide a platform for connecting up to regional markets, to the urban areas that are, uh, that are next to them. Um, again, provides this common language, provides this common platform to, uh, to be able to connect and, and have that conversation. Great. Um, as a last thought and remark, uh, again, just in a few seconds, how can philanthropy participate, not just more um, vigorously in this set of um, SDGs, but it, even in the post-2030 agenda? Anything we should be thinking about? Well, I, I think you've seen a um, progression from the Millennium Development Goals, which were focused primarily on developing countries, to the sustainable development goals, which are now worldwide. And as we've talked about, sort of go beyond even the resources of government and the managerial control of government alone. So I think in a post 2030 agenda, you're going to see greater recognition of the role of other stakeholders like business and philanthropy and civil society uh, and have them more officially at the table and I think the real role for philanthropy that can really help play that is to make sure that the local voice is a part of what comes after 2030. And that that local voice has real power. And frankly, you know, we called for a data revolution when we did the SDGs. We still need more data. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds crazy, but we don't really know what's happening with urban poverty in places like Africa where Kinshasa or Lagos are going to grow very significantly uh, over the next decade or so. 
Um, and so investing in the right kinds of data, the kind of data that will empower local voices uh, and local people, I think is, is also really um, an opportunity for philanthropy as well. Thank you, Tony Pippa, for sharing all your insights and your experience. And thank you, Global Philanthropy Forum, for hosting this important session today. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Jaheen. It's been wonderful to spend this time with you. Um, I appreciate the conversation. And, and thanks to our audience and for them thinking about Thank this. you. <laughs> Bye now.